Hello, my name is Mina. I'm a wild food specialist who lives in Leeds and I absolutely love wild food. This is my new podcast series that my husband has told me needs a name and we've decided Mina's basket case is the most apt. Um, I have got loads of amazing things in my basket currently. Everything I've got in it is stuff that I'm planning on using today. There was loads more stuff out there that we could eat that I chose to not put in my basket today because I didn't want to make something with them. So I shall tell you what's in my basket. This is Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed is going to form the first of my short videos and I'm going to be telling you how to harvest it, prepare it and I'll be showing you a really delicious recipe that you can make with Japanese knotweed. This is Japanese knotweed. Japanese knotweed is one of the most hated invasive weeds in the UK. It can grow up to 30 centimeters a day in ideal conditions and can very quickly overrun somebody's garden or green spaces like this. The good thing, however, about Japanese knotweed is that you can eat it. It's really quite tasty and tastes weirdly like rhubarb. Um, what I'm picking today, I'm going to be making into a Japanese knotweed cake. It's a vegan recipe and is surprisingly tasty. So this is what you want. You ideally want to pick it before it hits sort of shin height. When it gets really tall, it becomes very, very fibrous and just not very nice to eat. Um, so you just go in with your knife and you cut at the base of the stalk a piece like so. It looks a little bit like asparagus, um, but the flavor is very much like rhubarb. Even the smell of this plant is very weirdly like rhubarb. So I'm gonna put some in my basket now, there is a caveat with harvesting Japanese knotweed and that is tied in with the fact that it is a very invasive weed. So, I've just harvested these two shoots of Japanese knotweed. Now, when I put these into my basket, I need to make sure that none of the leaves or the tips of this plant happen to fall out of my basket and into a new place. Doing that would cause each one of these leaves and bits of trimmings and stuff of this could grow into a whole new Japanese knotweed colony. And you do not want that. So you need to be quite careful with how you transport this plant. I know I'm making it sound a little bit like nuclear waste, um, but it's not a plant you wanna mess around with. But that shouldn't put you off because it is really delicious. This is the Japanese knotweed that we picked earlier. Now I'm going to show you how to prepare it and we're going to be making it into a cake. Um, with this plant it's always important as I said to never ever throw all of these trimmings into your garden or the compost heap or the rubbish because it will just grow into a whole new plant. So here I've got two pots one for trimmings and one for the knotweed. This is going to be for the knotweed that I'm going to cook and the other one is going to be for the scraps that I'm not going to. So I'm just chopping it up into pieces about an inch long and chopping it into my saucepan as I go along. With these, when I'm cutting off the leaves, I normally cut the tops off because I have found that occasionally they can be a bit bitter and you don't really want that. So I trim the tops off, you end up with a stick like this and this is what I'm then chopping into one inch pieces. grams. And in this pan I've got all of my trimmings. So that's all of the tops as well as the butts that I've cut off. The reason why I've put them into a pan is because I am going to boil them before discarding. If you are found to have introduced into the wild Japanese knotweed, you can be liable for a fine of up to £5,000, which just doesn't seem worth it for something that you can so easily avoid. So what I tend to do is I 
put the trimmings into a pot, cover them with water and boil them until they're mushy. Then I just drain the water off and chuck the Japanese knotweed in the bin and you're all right. To this Japanese knotweed, however, that I am going to be eating later, I am adding some water. I've started with half a litre. I don't want it to be too watery. And then I'm going to find my pot lid and put it on, turn it onto a low heat and simmer it until the stems are soft and it's exuded a light pink liquid. My Japanese knotweed now smells amazing. And if I open it up, you can see that it's started to change colour. It's still simmering away happily. Give it a gentle stir. You can see that it's soft and it's starting to break up. So we don't want to go any further than this. So I am going to switch it off. Once your Japanese knotweed has cooled, you'll notice that it's come out with this lovely looking syrupy liquid. It's a beautiful pink colour and the smell is so very much like rhubarb. To stop my Japanese knotweed puree from being too thin, I actually scooped it all out of the water that I poached it in, which has left us with this liquid in the bottom of the pan. Now, don't throw this away. What you can do is add sugar to it, boil it down and make a really delicious syrup. What you have to do next is turn this into something that looks like applesauce. Now, you can do this by pushing it through a sieve, by pushing it through a hand-operated mouli, or you can be incredibly lazy like me and get a sort of sieve attachment for an old-fashioned Kenwood chef and it does the job for you. You just plonk in your ingredients and bring it down. Press it down and switch it on. When it's all gone through, you will be left with some bits that were too fibrous to pass through your sieve. You really don't want to eat these bits anyway, so we'll just leave them. And if you lift the sieve up, underneath is all this delicious, wonderful, rhubarb flavoured sauce. This is what is underneath the mouli. You can see the consistency is sort of like a slightly gloopy apple sauce. You don't want it to be too watery because otherwise when we make our cake later it's just going to be a watery, horrible, soggy mess. You want it to be a bit thicker than shop-bought apple sauce but thinner than homemade. Here I have 115 grams of butter and 200 grams of caster sugar. This recipe does not work without caster sugar. Um, because of the fact that A, I'm making it with gluten-free flour and not normal flour and B, it has no eggs to hold it together. So the caster sugar does something magical when it's baking and holds it together. Once it's light and fluffy, then you're ready to start adding the other ingredients. What I'm going to put in first is this. It's one cup full of Japanese knotweed puree. Going to give it a good stir. Once it looks like this, it's time to add the flour. If you were doing this with normal flour, you would fold in the flour by hand and not use the machine because you can end up with it becoming too thick and gloopy and horrible. Because I'm using gluten-free flour, I've used, um, it's 250 grams of flour with a quarter of a teaspoon of ground cloves, half a teaspoon of ground cinnamon, 
one teaspoon of bicarbonate of soda and I've added a quarter teaspoon of xanthan gum just to hold it all together. So I'm going to switch it on and mix it in. I'm going to rip it a bit longer because of the fact that it needs to activate the damper gun. So that's pretty much done. Now what I'm going to do is going to take this pot off, this bowl off, and add in my raisins and stir them about. I folded my raisins in and I'm just putting them into a greased and lined 8 inch cake pan. I've smoothed it out nicely and now I'm going to put it in an oven that's been preheated to 180 degrees on a conventional setting, so no fan. And it now needs to bake for about 45 minutes or until a skewer inserted comes out clean. The timer has just gone off on the oven, so I'm just going to open it and check on our cake. It's looking really lovely. skewers coming out clean so the cake is ready so I'm going to take it out of the oven and you can see that it's kind of pulling away from the sides which means it's perfectly cooked I'm going to leave it in the tin for two three minutes um, and then take it out my cake has had some time in its tin, so I'm just going to take it out and transfer it onto the wire rack to cool. When my cake had cooled completely, I iced it using a buttercream icing I made with some lemon zest and some Japanese knotweed juice. After that, I decorated it with some edible blossom I picked around my house. From the middle, we have some pear blossom, some pink cherry blossom, and lastly, some quince blossom. Thank you for watching, and do join me again on the next episode of Mina's Basket Case. In the meantime, don't forget to like and subscribe. Happy foraging!